All right, guys, um, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. So my name is Tabby, as you guys are probably familiar. We have Dr. Irfan Sheikh with us today. He is here to speak about to surviving and also thriving in intern year. A little bit of information about Dr. Sheikh. He is currently a neurologist, in fact, an epilepsy fellow um, at Mass General Hospital, um, Harvard Medical School. And he has graciously offered all this advice that comes from his experiences and his awards, including um, Alpha Omega Alpha induction. Um, in addition to that, the Arnold P. Gold Foundation Humanism and Excellence in Teaching Award, and also Outstanding Resident Award, granted in 2021. Um, so with that, Dr. Sheikh, if you could go ahead and um, give us a little bit of idea what we're talking about. <coughs> Oh, great, great. All right. So um, hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Tabby, for the introduction. So um, in this session, we're basically going to talk about how to not only do well in your intern year, but also some key points and things that you can do to stick out, stand out, and thrive. In addition to that, uh, we'll also discuss some uh, con areas of concerns that most interns typically go through or problems that most interns uh, typically go through in the first couple of weeks to months. And we'll talk about some ways that you can overcome some of those issues that will come across your ways. The session is supposed to be an hour long. Uh, so 10 minutes uh, before the hour is up, um, I'll pause for a second and ask everyone to enter their questions into the chat so that I can go ahead and answer them in a timely fashion. Um, okay, so, all right. Basically, how to succeed. Um, when you start, whatever everyone here or everyone who will be watching this video eventually will uh, undergo the match process and they will match into a residency program and they will undergo intern year or the intern year. So intern year is typically one year long and there is a difference between a preliminary internal medicine year uh, and there is also a difference between uh, a transitional year. So those two programs are a little bit different. They have different ways of functioning. They have different rotations, different responsibilities, et cetera, et cetera. People who typically go to transitional year will eventually go on to pursuing other subspecialties like dermatology, ophthalmology, uh, or even some surgical specialties like anesthesiology. Preliminary internal medicine year, they typically go into, they can go into dermatology, they can go to ophthalmology, they can even go into neurology. I did a preliminary internal medicine year. And for the most part, my rotations were very similar to those of the internal medicine intern year. Uh, nonetheless, though, intern year, the responsibilities are, for the most part, you know, very similar. Your duties and roles are pretty similar, uh, with some slight variation depending on the rotation you're on. So how to succeed in intern year? You know, everyone's going to be coming from very different backgrounds. People will be matching from all over the world, actually, into the United States or have matched from all over the world, the United States. One key thing is to be consistent. Uh, that is one thing that everyone always looks out for is consistency. It's more so than, you know, doing one day good work and the next day doing a, you know, half, half job or, um, you know, not even showing up the next day is being consistent. If you're going to come uh, five minutes early to round on patients, to see, uh, to do chart review, to talk to your senior residents, to talk to the senior, uh, to talk to some medical students, then the best advice I can give is to be consistent with that. People will start noticing and picking that up. Oh, this person comes in every single day, five minutes early. This person comes every single day, 20 to 30 minutes early, starts rounding up patients, starts to see, uh, starts to look through the charts, starts to document, starts to talk to the nursing staff beforehand. He does this every single day. That's consistency. People will start noticing that. If you go based upon a variable schedule, people will say, you know what, you're not really consistent. And they will give you less opportunities. They will give you less opportunities for like other academic roles. They will give you, uh, they will say, you know what, uh, let's not burden him with this research project uh, because he has, um, he's not, he, he's not really making time and he seems to be really burned out and he's not really consistent. They, it's, it's about building trust. Uh, and if you are consistent, it leads to trust. It leads to no self-doubt. And people will tend to rely on you and they know that you're going to be a trustworthy guy and you're going to be the one that follows through when times get tough. Um, another thing is that in addition to being consistent with showing up in other uh, consistent activities, such as writing on patients and writing notes, it's also to write thorough notes. If you're going to write notes for patients, make sure that 
that your notes are thorough. But don't make it thorough for one specific uh, day and then not thorough for the next day. So for example, if you write a very detailed history and present uh, HPI and write a very detailed assessment plan, uh, let's say for your first week, and then the second week you're like, you know what, I don't really like the rotation that I'm on, or I'm you're finding yourself coming in a little bit late every day, you're really tired, et cetera, which can happen. Fatigue is, is very likely in residency. Find a way where you can be consistent. If you're going to be writing thorough assessment and plans every single day in your notes. Make sure you're consistent with that. People will read it, your notes, and they will see the type of person you are in terms of consistency. So um, with that being said, what to carry with you when you are rounding or when you're seeing patients and when you're in the wards. Um, there are many different things that you can carry with you. Speaking from a neurologist perspective, when I was an intern, I kept always a stethoscope with me. I kept a, an internal medicine book, either whether it be the Oxford University Press book or the MGH Green book. Um, there's always access to MixApp. Uh, that's specifically for internal medicine residents. Um, your pager, your badge, your phone, always want to keep that on you as well too. Um, and if you have not taken step three yet, you will always want to make sure that you have UWorld step three downloaded either on your phone or make sure you have it downloaded on a computer. And this is going to be beneficial so that when you have downtime, you know, you're not just wasting time, you're you know, looking at questions on your phone and studying and reading because intern year can be very busy, it can be very challenging and you have to find time to study on your own for step three. Um, and most times it's going to be on days where you're off or days where you are let out early. Uh, so it's always useful to have step three QBank on your phone to just review questions. Other tools that I specifically had on me as an intern was a reflex hammer. I had a Snell and eye chart. I had a tuning fork on me. These are tools that you, uh, that neurologists would typically use. Internal medicine residents, they didn't typically have the neurology equipment. They usually just had a stethoscope plus or minus reflex hammer. Other than that, that's pretty much all they had. So one, one key thing that, um, oh, sorry, this actually looks, I'm just gonna make this a little bit smaller. All right, hold on real quick. You. Sorry about that. Okay, one key thing that most um, people always will feel or they could be experiencing is something called imposter syndrome. Now, in a nutshell, imposter syndrome, it's a condition where interns or residents feel anxious and not experiencing success internally. They're Every day they're going to the same actions in a mundane fashion. And despite their uh, high performing, despite them being high performing in external objective ways, they just feel like they're not experiencing success internally. And some ways that this often presents itself um, for residents is that they don't feel happy in their day-to-day -day work. They feel overly fatigued, they feel tired, they feel like they're insufficient. And they, you know, when someone else is rounding or when you guys are amongst your colleagues, if other people's are, if other uh, cohorts are speaking about some of the things that they're involved in, extracurricular activities, and you're looking at yourself internally, you're not feeling that same sort of happiness within yourself, then that's a good sign of feeling imposter syndrome. So this is a pretty vicious cycle or can be a pretty vicious cycle. So you're assigned with a new project or task, you all, all of a sudden start experiencing anxiety, procrastination, it takes you a long time to do things, You uh, or you're over-prepared, over-preparation. Um, for example, you're asked to see a, a consult and you're just looking and rummaging through everything, all the literature, everything there's to know about that disease, and you lose time. And actually what's more important, which is seeing the patient doing history physical examination and you know uh, coming up with an assessment and plan. Um, additionally, so in addition to feeling anxiety, procrastination, over-preparation, um, you'll have issues with project completion, you'll have a brief relief and sense of accomplishment. And this rationalization says, oh, I was lucky. You always say, oh, I was lucky. You know, somebody else would have done a better job. You never really appreciate, you know, the, the things that you do well. And this can increase self-doubt, anxiety, and feeling like, you know, you're fraud or feelings like you don't belong there. This happened to me quite a bit during my intern year too, where I always question myself like, oh my God, how did I make it here? Do I even deserve to be here? Like, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that. Yeah, I saw this patient, 
yeah, I took their history of physical examination, but you know, so what? Everybody else is doing it. What am I doing that's unique? What am I doing that's different? And it created a lot of self-doubt, a lot of anxiety. And, you know, I felt like I didn't belong there. So what did I do? How do you come out of feeling an imposter syndrome? So one thing is to focus on the facts. These are a lot of, these are, this is a pretty bulky and heavy slide. I'm not going to, you know, talk about all of these, but I'll go through some of the key points. I think you guys will get recording of this a little bit later on, so you guys can review this on your own. But step one is to focus on the facts. You know, imposter syndrome, it makes you feel like you're not qualified for your position. So being confident and building up your strengths and becoming more aware of your strengths is a key way. Uh, also, <clears throat> Conducting and, uh, conducting and analyzing your strengths, your weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. We call it SWOT, S-W-O-T. Next thing to do is to acknowledge, validate, and let go. So the best method to combat the feeling is to acknowledge what you are feeling, that you are feeling inadequate, and to validate that, hey, you know what? It's okay that I feel this way, and then let go of, of that feeling. Um, another step is to reframe your thoughts. So you need to reshape the way you think about yourself, and you need to set realistic goals. If if your cohorts, and it very way, uh, very well may be likely that your cohorts are seeing more patients, doing a lot more research, doing a lot more education, and you know you're finding your you're finding your within yourself that you want to be at that level, but it's harder for you to do so because you're you know having issues with efficiency. You're trying to learn the language. You're trying to learn the EMR system. You're trying to learn the lay of the land, how to communicate with patients, the ins and outs, or the culture of the hospital. It's okay. Set realistic goals. All right. So. For example, for the first week, okay, I'm going to get done with all my notes on time today. Second week, okay, I'm going to come 30 minutes early every single day. And on top of that, I'm going to finish all my notes on time. So you want to increase your ability or increase your expectations or goals every week that goes by within residency. And you want to make sure that you're not only accomplishing a goal, but you're also keeping that habit of the goal that you accomplish. So if you set aside a goal within the first week, okay, you know what, I'm going to come 30 minutes early every day. You not only do you want to make that a goal by the end of the week, but you also want to establish that as a habit. And same thing that goes with note writing, same thing that goes with, you know, adapting to the culture. And then as you get more responsibility, same thing goes with teaching, education, and research as well, too. The next step is to share how you're feeling. Now, oftentimes, residency can be very lonely, you know. Uh, you're working almost 12 hours a day. Um, in some programs. And it's oftentimes that, you know, you'll feel like you're in this endless cycle where you go to wake up, go to work, do your work all day. And then after that, around 5 to 6 p.m., you'll come back home, you'll eat, you'll sleep, pretty much exhausted from doing anything else. And, you know, per GME, you'll get one day off a week. But within that one week, you're taking care of groceries, you're doing laundry, you're getting ready for the next week, and plus minus study. So it's 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 easy to feel distraught. It's easy to feel like you don't belong there. Uh, and it's easy to feel upset and not only that, but depressed at times. So if you're feeling like that, please reach out to someone that you trust, your cohorts, your co-fellows, co-residents, and also your senior chief residents as well, too. You'll be surprised um, that this is actually a very common thing that happens during residency nowadays. And there are a lot of well-being chapters and projects in a lot of residency programs to help you cope with some of these things. And always uh, have a, or look for a mentor if you can, if your program supplies you or provides you with a mentor, you know, reach out to your mentor. You'd be surprised how many times I reached out to my mentor in residency saying, hey, listen, you know what, I'm actually struggling with this kid. Do you know any efficient ways to help, you know, take care of this? And they say, hey, this is a good point. That's not the first time I heard about that. This is what I did. And they tell me about their experience. And then I kind of learned it or adapted some of their styles. Another thing is to learn from your peers. It's okay. You know, you, everyone, uh, or at least all IMGs, including myself, came from different backgrounds and different cultures. In China, where I did my medical school, they did things entirely differently. When I came here, actually, there was a very steep learning curve going from medical school to residency. And there was a lot of things that I didn't understand, specifically the culture. So it was not unusual for me to ask some of my cohorts who were American medical graduates, and by the way, are all super nice, um, hey, listen, uh, I saw you doing a reflex that way. Can you tell me why you did it that way? Uh, I want to learn from you. And um, me being a neurologist or aspiring to be a neurologist, at many occasions, I actually had some of my senior neurology residents monitor me as an intern, looking at me and how I did the neurological examination to make sure I was doing it the right way and correcting me if I did any mistakes. 
I also had a couple of buddies of mine who were internal medicine focused and they had issues with performing a cardiovascular examination. So they asked their senior resident and chief resident to sort of supervise them on their physical examination technique and help them learn a little bit. So this is okay to do. And as residents, you'll see, we're all trying to help each other. We're all trying to grow from one another. Um, and everyone is sort of in the same boat. It's a learning environment. We try to create as learned, as learner friendly as possible. Um, and then the last step is, you know, if you do a good job, irrespective of how of how small that may be, pat yourself on the back. If you accomplish one of your goals, for example, coming in every single day, 30 minutes early um, to look at, you know, your patients, to round on your patients, to, you know, do your notes. It's, that's an accomplishment itself. Pat yourself on the back. What does that mean? Not just, you know, go like this over your shoulders, but it's okay to splurge a little bit. You guys are getting paid. Go out, go to that nice restaurant, get yourself a good cup of coffee, get yourself some shoes. Um, for example, for me, anytime I did a good job, I actually went and bought myself a fresh pair of Jordans. So these are some things that you guys can do to help, you know, feel like you feel accomplished. So I will briefly touch base about some of the resources that are, that I, you know, generally recommend understanding that most people who watch this will go into a lot of different subspecialties. Uh, but in general, if you have not taken step three, uh, you would benefit from getting UWorld world step three in addition to mix that for internal medicine. Um, and then, Mix up comes with corresponding videos, questions for each rotation, et cetera. So um, what that basically means is that mix up is the internal medicine version that's focused for the internal medicine boards that you will take after three years of internal medicine residency. What I find helpful or found helpful was even though I wasn't a internal medicine um, graduate or going into internal medicine as a residency, as a preliminary internal medicine neurology focused resident, um, I actually use MixApp through various subspecialties that actually help me prepare for the inter for UWorld Step Three. So, for example, if I was on a if I was on a nephrology rotation for kidney, I would look at the videos for MixApp. I would do all the questions for MixApp, and then I would move on to doing UWorld for nephrology only. So that's how I would tackle that specific rotation, um, and I would go through that with. I would go through that process like for infectious disease, cardiology, rheumatology, et cetera, et cetera. And even went through that for neurology as well. Additional things that you would want to use as a resource to keep in mind is up to date. I think it's a very good resource to use, especially if you're starting out as an intern, as well as other literature. Uh, you know, PubMed is a very good one. Professional guidelines that your hospital will produce. Some hospitals have very specific guidelines on how to approach. <clears throat> various types of diseases and that has to deal with hospital best practice guidelines and whatnot. So you may want to look at those a little bit more carefully, which will be provided to you on the very first day of intern year. <coughs> Excuse me. So time management, how to be efficient. There are three things that we should focus on when it comes to time management, how to be efficient, how to fix routine and practices to avoid. <coughs> Excuse me. So, <clears throat> How to be efficient. Um, practice makes perfect. The more times you do something, the easier it's going to take. The easier it's going to be. You know, when you write your notes for the first time, it may take you some time to do it. However, once you develop a understanding of how to approach a note, and you can pick the templates up from your senior residents or learn tips and tricks from your senior residents. But once you pick up your own formula for how to write a note effectively, um, and you practice that formula, you're going to develop perfection and it's going to be, you know, it's going to lead to efficiency. Waking up early and coming in early is very key, in my opinion. Uh, and that would actually start in, in that process of waking up early and coming in early actually starts even earlier. It's actually going to sleep early at night and waking up early and then coming in early. It's hard to wake up early and be really efficient and productive if you're going to sleep very late at night and not getting enough sleep. You're going to be tired. You're going to be exhausted. You're going to be fatigued. Also, when it comes back to note writing, if you are taking quite a bit of time and persistently taking a lot of time, it's three months in and you're still taking about an hour long to do your notes, you may need to touch base with your senior residents to see exactly how to be more efficient, look at their notes, see how they're writing their notes, and you may have to change your technique a little bit. But by six months in, it shouldn't take you more than about 15 to 20 minutes to do one note. And as a second year resident, it should not take you more than five to 10 minutes to do a note. 
So as you go more advanced in your career, it should take you a lot more faster and faster. How to fix routine. So if you find yourself being inefficient, the first thing to do is to have insight that, you know what, I'm not being efficient. If all your colleagues are going home at 5 p.m. and you find yourself going home at 9, 10 o'clock p.m., that's a problem because you will be responsible for going home and eating and sleeping, yes, but also for coming in the very next day early again. Um, <clears throat> coming in early and getting a head start and seeing patient is a good way to fix a routine. And taking a sometimes even taking a break, stepping away from uh, work just for a brief moment and seeing things from a fresh perspective can also help increase efficiency and help to fix routine. Um, also, one key thing I'll always advise, um, you know, all residents and incoming residents um, and even, you know, some of my cohorts is always eating and sleeping habits. You can't be a productive resident if you're hungry and if you're extremely tired and fatigued. And there's going to be a lot of studies that you guys will read when you guys are interns that poor sleep actually leads to a lot of uh, mistakes. So getting good sleep and eating healthy are key good ways uh, to be one, not only efficient, but also productive. Some things that you want to avoid. Now, there's a lot of things uh, I can mention here, but just to be brief, uh, and I would say the most important thing is to avoid anything that is not work-related, essentially, that takes away time. I, and I was always taught as a Kaplan educator that uh, wasting time is the ultimate sin. Uh, that was from one of my mentors, Dr. Wazir Kudrat. Uh, and I strongly believe that wasting time is in the ultimate sin. If you are, if you have a, a ton of patient notes to do and you're, you're swiping through TikTok, you're Instagramming, you're Facebooking on social media, um, and that's going to waste time. And that time has to be made up. That's going to in order for you to finish those notes now, in order for you to finish your work, it's going to come out of your own personal time. And that's going to lead to increased burnout. Not only that, but if someone if someone catches you, they may say that, hey, you know what, this guy's not really a hard worker. He's just messing around. Obviously, as residents and uh, residents, you guys will be a part of a big cohort, a group of people. And it's going to be hard not to like, you know, look at YouTube videos here and there, which is okay. But if you're persistently doing it and wasting time and you have consoles to see, and instead of seeing consoles, you're you know, looking at TikTok videos, it's going to be a problem. All right, so professionalism co uh, and co-resident. So if you, what happens if you have a conflict with a co-resident? You know, oftentimes it may be imminent. Uh, even as a resident, I personally had some conflicts with some co-residents. So most institutions programs will have a culture or a process that's uh, of, a, of like a, an appropriate escalation technique or mannerisms. So you should follow them. Um, and when in doubt of how to proceed, you need to always discuss with your senior or chief resident. And if there's a problem that arises with either your co-resident or a junior resident, you should always talk with um, your senior resident or your chief resident about how to proceed further. Um, senior and chief residents, they are put into positions as they're familiar with how the process works and how things in the hospital institution works. So if you ever have a problem before confronting that resident and or cohort directly, you know, touch base with your senior resident or chief resident to see exactly about how to escalate the process accordingly. Oftentimes, if you're unsure and you bring it to the attention of the co-resident directly, that could actually increase, um, you know, create a more hostile environment and there may be further miscommunication. You can get in some trouble with that. So my personal experience and my opinion is that when in doubt, if you have a confrontation with a co-resident, either senior or junior, always confront with the senior or chief resident. Now, what if you have a problem with your senior or chief resident? Who do you go to? So in that case, then um, you can either talk uh, talk amongst your peers to see if they have similar experiences. And if other you know, of your cohorts or peers have similar experiences with your chief or senior resident, then it may be worthwhile to bring it to the attention of some leadership, i.e. program director, associate program director. Again, all these things are very program specific and there will be definitely outlined and highlighted more on the first day of intern when you guys go in for your introduction. Communication is absolutely key. This includes communication to patient care team members, including the attending senior resident interns, pharmacist, pharmacists and medical students, but also communication outside of that uh, paradigm. Communication with regards to uh, your patients, uh, communication regarding to nursing staff, <clears throat> On a given care and a given internal medicine team or a given uh, intern team, 
per se, uh, it is not unusual for there to be a, an attending, a senior resident, a couple of interns, two or three, a pharmacist and medical students all rounding together. So that's a, t that's a typical care team. Um, now, pharmacists, you, you're depending on what facility you're at. Some institutions have pharmacists, some institutions do not. Here at Mass General, when we're rounding uh, under epilepsy monitoring unit service, there are pharmacists that round with us as well, as well as privacy and technical considerations. Um, you want to make sure that you talk with IT on the very first day, in which your program will all tell you this specifically, uh, about how to encrypt your phone or your computer. Uh, now, every hospital has their own culture of how they do communication regarding patient care. Um, in a nutshell, generally, all I can say is that you want to avoid sharing patient uh, specific information or patient health information on social media platforms. That's a big no-no. Don't do it. Uh, that's a huge HIPAA violation. <clears throat> okay. Um, also, patient-related interactions. Be thorough, be focused, be precise and respectful. Uh, you'd be surprised. These patients are uh, very good um, <clears throat> advocates for the interns. As interns, you will spend more time with the patient than an attending does. Those are the facts. Um, so it's not unusual for a patient to want to, you know, trust your judgment and talk to you more freely yeah. and openly in comparison to an attending that he's only sees him for five minutes. Um, and one thing that's a really hot topic right now is this diversity and uh, equality inclusion um, is never to assume gender roles. Um, you know, always ask a patient, you know, their pronouns before approaching them. That's that's something that um, you will learn as well through your health screens training and through other, uh, you know, uh, onboarding processes. Um, my biggest philosophy is that sometimes over communication is better than under communication. When in doubt about a specific case, about a specific laboratory testing result or a specific imaging study, it's always best to over communicate, i.e. touch base with your senior residents or chief residents about the findings, depending on who your senior resident is. Good thing about in, being an intern is that you will be coming in and there will, there's always going to be oversight, either by the attending or by the senior resident on the service. So you'll never be alone. There's always gonna be a senior fellow or senior resident that's gonna be with you supervising everything you do. So don't feel like you're gonna be making the shots or calls on your own. There may be some times where they'll ask you for your opinion, hey, so what is your assessment and plan? And you can be you know, more well to give your uh, opinion a thought, um, but have an open line of communication. when. At the end of a patient rounding, the, the attending will say, hey, listen, you know what? I think this patient may be having a heart attack. Uh, let's go ahead and order troponins and the CKMB and an EKG. It's going to be a responsibility to follow up with those laboratory results and those testing modalities. And depending on what they show, it's going to be a responsibility to communicate that with the either senior fellow or senior resident on the service about how to proceed further. Again, over communication is better than under communication. Even if the labs come back as uh, so so equivocal, you're not really too sure, it's better to over communicate and be like, hey, listen, hey, uh, Mr. Hey, uh, Dr. Smith, the labs for patient Joe uh, came back and uh, they are normal. Uh, what, you know, I just want to inform you and let you know. And they'll be like, hey, thanks for letting me know. Senior residents and senior fellows will see that as a sign of initiative. Hey, this guy follows up with things, and this is something that we look for. Okay. Now let's uh, jump a little bit forward and ask, uh, talk about evaluations. Um, you will be evaluated um, depending on which program you are. At the residency program that I trained at, it was a 360 evaluation. Uh, evaluations were performed by other co-residents, program directors, attendings, nurses, patients, even sanitation engineers, to be honest with you, or any team member can provide feedback for you. Um, so it's always good to be, you know, what I like to say, on your best behavior. Um, be a saint is what I like to say. Um, also, uh, site evaluations. So evaluation can also be at the patient's bedside or uh, even outside a patient room or conference area. It could be anywhere. So what does that basically mean? Let's say you are rounding and it's a big team. You're rounding with your senior resident, you're rounding with other interns and you're rounding with an attending and you're presenting the case. You start off by presenting your case. Um, evaluations can come even directly after your presentation of that patient before walking into the room, your attending may jump out to you and say, hey, listen, you, know what? you focus on that physical examination. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about that? 
uh, that's a sign of evaluation right there. That's an indirect way that attendings usually provide evaluations to you on the spot. That just means that um, you probably need to present the history and his. Uh, sorry, you probably need to present the physical examination a little bit more clearly. So that's one indirect way you can pick up about how you're performing. Okay, so um, I'll take another example. Let's say, for example, uh, you're on the cardiology service and you are, you know, seeing a patient. You have obviously on the cardiology service, you may see a lot of patients with congestive heart failure, and you always uh, forget to check lower extremity pitting edema. So one way your attending may comment on you or may evaluate you while you're presenting the case is after you finish the plan, like you say, okay, uh, assessment is CHF with preserved ejection fraction, plan is to do diuretics and monitor, uh, you know, BNP levels, et cetera. Um, your attending may say, hey, listen, by the way, did you check for lower extremity pitting edema? And you say, oh, I forgot about that. Remember that because for the next patient you see with congestive heart failure, that should be a key for you to check lower extremity pitting edema if that makes sense. Um, another way for uh, uh, getting evaluated is always asking for feedback on presentations, either towards either towards the end of rotations or at the end of your presentation, or even at the end of a service, um, or generally about things that you may feel insecure about, for example, notes, patient physical examinations, history taking, et cetera. Uh, when I was an intern, I always, fe I always sought for feedback from my senior residents about how my history was, about how my physical examination was, about key things that I wanted to perform in. And I learned a lot from my senior residents because they're the ones that were so close to me uh, on the service. They're the ones that I reported to. Those are the people that I discussed my assessment and physical examination to and my plan with. Um, so I learned a lot from them. And those are the greatest people that provided me with feedback. So I think we already talked a little bit about <clears throat> indirect feedback. I also want to talk a little bit more about what is known as like silent feedback process. Now, this is something interesting, okay? Um, now, let's say you are presenting that same patient with congestive heart failure, and you're presenting, you provide a HPI, you provide a physical examination, you provide an assessment, you provide a plan, and the attending does not ask you any questions at all, does not, um, does not, uh, does not interrupt you at all, um, and at the end of the presentation says, okay, good, let's go see the patient. That basically means that you did an excellent job, um, that your history was perfect, your physical examination was perfect, your assessment was on point, and your plan was also on point, and it's everything that he agreed with. That's, 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 that's perfect. Um, <clears throat> those are what I like to say, uh, silent or positive feedback. And sometimes they may not even say good, uh, good job or good at the end. Doesn't mean that you, know, you did not do a good job, just means that they have nothing else to add, which is an essentially a good sign. So that's another way how feedback may come into place, okay? So that, that was uh, informal feedback. Something more formal is biannual feedbacks or uh, feedback once carried out once every six months. At my program, it's usually every six months. Some programs may have every year. Some programs may have every three months, depending on your institution. Uh, and what practices they already have in place. This is usually performed by the program director, the associate program director, or program leadership, i.e. the chair of the program. And they'll take feedback across all boards, they'll review it, they'll look at your ACGME milestones, and they'll say, hey, listen, yeah, you're meeting this milestone, you're not meeting this milestone, you're, I got this feedback, this is good, I got this feedback, this feedback is actually not good, and they'll talk to you, that's more formal feedback. They'll also talk to you about, you know, your goals, about, you know, residency and what you hope to achieve and whatnot. And that's your time not to be shy and express and wish what you're looking to get out of in residency and what you want so that they can help set you up with mentorship so they can help guide you in terms of reaching your career pathway. Um, other ways that you're evaluated on, as I said before, is ACGM scores and new innovations. Um, also, any comments from other doctors, not nursing staff, medical students or other team members that you may interact with. Um, again, like I say, it's best to be uh, the best person at all times because you never know who may be evaluating you. At one point, I remember in residency, I had a sanitation engineer evaluate me because I helped him out with carrying out the trash and opening the door, uh, which I thought was very interesting. Um, so yeah, you never know who will be uh, evaluating you at all. Again, informal feedback in addition to uh, the uh, at the end of the rotation um, is... This may, like I said, this may occur daily. Um, and some of the criteria for informal feedback is, you know, ability to understand system-based processes, 
ability to understand the practice of medicine. This is all, you know, based on the ACGME sort of criteria. You may also get informal feedback about your professionalism, about your social skills, uh, even about milestones as well. Um, one thing I will say, though, is that it, no, it's very rare that an incoming intern will be a five out of five on all their milestones. Um, if that was the case, then why do residency, right? So, but don't feel bad. It's okay to, you know, in the first couple of months to have lower milestone scores. What program leadership wants to see is improvement. If you're starting out with a two or three, and in the course of three years, you're getting a four and five, that's great. That's improvement. That shows that you were able to adapt, learn, and progress as a resident. However, if you're starting out with, you know, outstanding evaluation, you're getting fours and fives, and towards the end of your residence, you're getting ones and twos, that's pretty bad. You got to figure out what happened. And program directors and leadership will comment on that and ask you what's going on. If you're starting at three or four and you're consistent at three or four with minimal improvement, that's also a little bit of a gray zone. Um, and it depends on program directors and leadership and uh, what they are. My program directors, uh, they always wanted to see improvement. No matter what score I got on my in-training service exams, they always said, hey, you know what? You got that, but I think you could do better. You know, I think you got that, but honestly, I think you could do a lot better. But that's how my program director always was with me. And I, I, I commended him a lot for that because it always made me want to do more. It always said that, you know what, I think maybe I can do more. If he says I can do it, then maybe I can do it. And I always wanted to make, and it always inspired me to achieve more than what I, I thought I could do. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, so, and again, gradual progression. Um, good history and physical examination in the beginning of your residency training as an intern and your assessment and plan efficiency and uh, productivity will get better towards uh, the end of your residency training. That's just the natural way things are. So um, I guess this was a very important uh, topic that uh, Tabby wanted me to discuss is about receiving consults. Um, I was taught and I uh, learned the hard way is that never refuse a consult. Um, I understand sometimes it may be downright silly. Uh, never refuse a consult. Uh, what you can do, though, is research a consult. That is something that I do recommend strongly, is research a consult. Um, and this must be, uh, this must be, when you research a consult, it must be formulated and processed and executed thoroughly. Um, what, what does that mean? Obviously, we're all coming from different backgrounds, and sometimes the way we speak about, you know, receiving a consult may be misconstrued as a negative response, when in fact, it's just that we're trying to understand and harmonize the fact that we got a consult and really go do it the best we can, but in order to do so, we need more information. So the best way to do that is by simply asking your senior resident uh, or whoever provided you the consult, um, uh, I received a consult, why would you like me to see the consult? And sometimes asking too many questions may be perceived or misconstrued as you not wanting to see it. Um, so it's okay to ask the question, you know, why should I see the consult? What's the consult for? Um, but then asking too many focused questions may be misconstrued as, you know what, I'm not too sure why they wanted me to see the consult, you know, or maybe misconstrued as, you know, maybe this person doesn't want to see the consult or uh, inferred as this intern is refusing to see the consult. Um, in addition to that, in addition to questioning why you got the consult or what the consult is for uh, or why you should see the patient, you should also investigate and look through the chart and do your own research and then get back to the senior resident um, if you want to, I wouldn't say, uh, if you want to sort of change the consult or if there's anything else that you should get away from this consult. So for example, you get a call for uh, wanting to see a patient that uh, they called you about seeing a patient with COVID and you're on the infectious disease service and they want you to see a patient with suspected COVID, all right? You get a call from your senior resident, hey, um, Dr. Sheikh, I got a call for me, I got a call from so-and-so um, and they want us to see a new patient with suspected COVID, can you go see this patient? <clears throat> So it's okay to say, okay, oh, so they do they have COVID or is it somebody that they're worried about COVID? I think that's a legitimate question to ask because that lets you know if you should get you know PPE in place and how you should get set up. Uh, but if you ask the question, oh, well, did they not do a COVID testing? Like they should already know. Does the patient have a cough? Does the patient have shortness of breath? That may be taken a little bit hostile. 
and maybe misconstrued or misinterpreted as maybe this intern is trying to refuse to seeing a consult. So if you get a call, hey, Dr. Sheikh, uh, I have this patient. I want you to see patient uh, suspected for COVID. Oh, did the patient have uh, uh, peep, did the patient have a testing already or do I need PPE or not? Oh, well, yeah, the patient already had testing done and uh, the testing results came back positive and um, they want to see the patient. Okay, then you go to the charts. You go to the charts and you see, hey, listen, in the charts, the testing that they said was positive actually was not definitively positive, it was equivocal. So then um, you do some more research and you see that you know the patient on chest X-ray has cardiomegaly. You see that there's a lot of signs for congestive. Uh, there is like congestion in the heart, there's curly A and B lines. On top of that, there's an echo which shows a 15% ejection fraction. And then you call your senior resident up, hey, um, I know that cause you want me to go see, you said it was for COVID, but I'm seeing a lot of evidence on here for CHF and I don't see that cardiology is consulted. Do you think I should reach out to the team and ask them in addition to me seeing them for COVID if they also want, uh, if they also want cardiology on board given the fact that I found all this other evidence? They may see that as, hey, you know what? This guy not only did his research, this intern not only did their research by going through the chart and coming up with differentials, but also came to the idea that this patient probably was, uh, that there could have been additional team members on this patient's care team that could provide some additional help and answers. So that would be a sample way to go about it. So now we're requesting a consult. Um, it's okay to request a consult. Um, here at uh, MGH, it's typically, um, we typically try to resolve all medicine issues on our own and typically only consult if there is a need for some intervention, i.e. surgical uh, procedure or if the consult is just way beyond our skill set, then we typically consult. Um, so I think the threshold of the consult varies on each specialty and individual, um, and also the culture of the hospital specifically. Um, personally speaking, I try to manage most of my patients. I try to look on up to date. And then if there is a specific question that I have, I'll call up the consult for that specific question. Um, one key thing is that if you're interested in a specific fellowship, try to manage that entity or that disease process on your own. So for example, if you're interested in cardiology, try to manage cardiology problems on your own and then call up, if you have any issues, then call up the cardiology consult be like, hey, listen, I have a consult. I think this patient has, uh, it has a heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Uh, they're congested. I started XYZ, et cetera. Uh, can, you, uh, can you please come and see if there's anything else I've done uh, that needs to be taken care of? Or, or can you please, uh, I guess, <laughs> make sure my work is good enough, you know? Um, or maybe have a focus question. You know, listen, uh, I'm on day three yeah. of trying to manage the CHF and I still see that the patient has edema, the creatinine levels are slowly rising. I need your help to help me get the volume reduced on this patient. So focus questions like that would be, in, uh, would be helpful. And on top of that, the consulting physician will see, hey, you know what? This person went out of their way to look at the consult uh, more carefully and manage their patient more carefully and asking me focus questions that I can help them out with. So when you request a consult, I'll, this is just the way I do it. Uh, I always say, hello, sorry to bother you. This is Dr. Sheikh. I always say the, I always say my name. First I say, sorry to bother you. Then I say my name, my name is Dr. Sheikh. I am a fellow uh, in epilepsy at MGH. Uh, I was wondering uh, if you can uh, see this patient for me. Uh, he is admitted for seizures and um, this patient now developed uh, shortness of breath, coughing and wheezing, and now there's evidence of lower extremity edema. Um, I was hoping to request a consult for cardiology for concern for congestive heart failure. Um, do you mind if you guys come and see them? In addition, you may get questions asked by the consulting provider, by the person you consult. They may ask you questions. So be sure that you know the imaging, the labs, and medications that are uh, already on the patient. They may ask you questions. You don't want to. You want to sound like, uh, or at least you want to show that you've done the work on your end, that you've done your due diligence. Um, and then, if they ask you questions, you'll have the answer for them. So, additionally, <clears throat> if you receive a consult, uh, con if you receive constant grief from a consulting team, um, so let's say you call the cardiologist up for that concern. And they say, hey, oh, you don't know how to manage congestive heart failure? Aren't you like a fellow? Shouldn't you know how to do this? Isn't that your responsibility? What type of training did you receive? Obviously, those are special that you know anyone would say this, but sometimes it happens. 
if that happens, apologize, acknowledge the problem. Like, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry that you know that you're upset with this, but I would really like you to see the console per the request of my team. Um, and acknowledge the problem that you know. I'm sorry that <clears throat> I'm sorry that I'm calling you. I'm sorry that you feel disturbed about this. Um, and then one thing you also want to do is share this experience with your senior resident. Sometimes um, that person uh, who you request the consult from, they um, will be talked to by senior leadership because they'll get escalated and you may see a change in attitude from that consulting provider in the future. So always share the experience with your senior resident and ask for guidance about how to proceed. <clears throat> One thing you want to avoid doing is dis a disorganized thought process when you are consulting. So. What I like to do is when I'm consulting, I write everything down. Okay, I'm consulting cardiology. I'm consulting cardiology for congestive heart failure on this patient in room, in room, you know, say the room number, and then write down all the pertinent labs and imaging studies, and then consult. Have an organized thought process when consulting. It makes it a lot easier. Obviously, as interns, it may be hard to do this because you don't know really what's important, what's not important. Um, <clears throat> So once you understand how and what is important when consulting, be focused and present only that data and have additional data ready as backup if they ask for it. So for example, if you are worried about, you know, let's take my hypothetical patient who is admitted to the hospital for seizures and you are concerned about this patient having congestive heart failure, then don't start the conversation by saying, hey, I want to have a consult with cardiology about this patient who came in four days ago with seizures. His seizure, they look like, the seizures look like, you know, right upper extremity tonic posturing. There was some tongue biting. Uh, we treated his seizures with Keppra, and now he's here. His seizures are doing really well. I mean, that's great. You told me a lot of information about the seizures, but the question was mainly around CHF and the concern for CHF. So that's how you want to be a little bit more organized, focused and organized. Um, again, don't mention random things. You know, I don't think consulting physicians care too much about what the patient had for breakfast or what the patient was doing or what you were doing when the patient was uh, you know, having CHF exacerbation. That's a little bit less important. Okay, so I think we have roughly about 10 minutes left. So I will continue going through this, um, but in the meantime, you guys can ask questions uh, and then I'll be more than happy to answer them when the time is up. So falling behind, it's not unusual for interns and residents to fall behind. If you are struggling, please reach out to your program support services, um, which they should be available. Uh, this includes employee assistant programs, your financial advisors, your human resources department, program leadership, program director, associate program director, and most importantly, never be too afraid to ask for help. Know your limits. If you feel like you're taking on a lot of responsibility, you're not only being bombarded with clinical duties, but now you're getting responsibilities for teaching, for education, and on top of that for research, know your limits. It's okay to say no, especially in the first couple of months. Um, <clears throat> but again, never say no to clinical care. It's okay to say no regarding like research and other extracurricular projects. Um, for example, if your colleagues are always going out and they ask you to go out and you notice that going out at night causes you to have problems with functioning at work the next day, it's okay to say no. Hey, listen, I'm sorry I can't go out today. I have to get some sleep. Um, also, identifying the problem is uh, a big step in sort of finding the solution. Uh, if you have a specific problem, um, identify it and ask for help ask for help regarding the specific problem. And sometimes if someone is telling you about a negative change in behavior, potentially the problem has escalated to a point where you are not aware of it anymore. And this is this is this happens quite a bit actually. Um, so if someone is telling you about a problem that you never noticed before at all, if someone's telling you, hey listen, you know your notes are uh, very short and I really don't understand them at all, it may have gone to a point where listen, that you've been writing such short notes for such a long period of time to be more efficient that you have not become aware of the problem that your notes are yes efficiently done but not providing any additional information and that may be a step that you may need to take to change <clears throat> so poor behavior um not really tolerated well during residency um what does that mean um you may, the, you may get in trouble with like your program director or your associate program director, um, and that goes on your permanent record. And when you apply for fellowships, that may show up. Um, in a general rule, I like to say, do not do bad things. If you are, uh, if you do come across a problem, which everyone will, um, 
Everyone makes mistakes. It happens, especially when you're in training. It's the time to make mistakes, but it's normal. Everyone makes mistakes. Residency is the time to make mistakes. It's best to make the mistakes during residency than it is to make them in real life when you're on your own practicing in the field. What um, I was told is that every resident gets one. Um, how that what that means, I'll let you guys interpret as as such. But if you have if you make one big mistake in residency, that's your one mistake. That's you're you're allowed one mistake. Um, <clears throat> additionally, do not do bad things. Do not be too overconfident. Um, and take responsibility for your mistakes and rectify them. If someone says, hey, listen, um, I don't like the way you did your notes. Hey, listen, I'm sorry about that. I'll do better. Simple as that. So fellowship, I could talk all day about fellowship. Uh, fellowship is a huge topic. And I think Tabby is going to uh, maybe in the future set aside a separate time where we could talk about how to get into fellowship. What are some steps you could do to get into fellowship? Uh, what are some tips and tricks? In a nutshell, um, research your desired area of specialty. It may be different and will vary depending on your current rotation. The best rule that I like to say to all my incoming, all the incoming interns is to enjoy every single rotation you're on, experience every single rotation you're on, and keep an open mind about the rotations you're on. Um, because you may not be doing that rotation again. You may not be doing that area of medicine again, you know, forever. So for example, uh, given the fact that I was going into neurology as a preliminary internal medicine, I really took the initiative to do well on all my subspecialties of medicine because that was the last time I was going to be in that specialty um, for the rest of my career. Um, and it was the first time where I could see how that specialty is practiced. Um, and then when I got into neurology, I really took the initiative to enjoy every single subspecialty of neurology that I could be on because I was not going to be doing that as long term. I was going to be more focused in epilepsy. So uh, one thing, though, is that once you've decided on a certain fellowship, uh, the next thing to do is to discuss it with your senior residents or faculty within that area of medicine and uh, express that you want to learn more about that field. If you're interested in cardiology, speak to the fellow of cardiology. Speak to the senior attending on cardiology. Tell them, hey, listen, I think I'm interested in cardiology. Um, what can I do to um, explore this field? Do you have any research projects? Do you have any educational projects? Can you tell me a little bit about the field? Uh, and they'll go ahead and lay it out for you. Oh, yeah, that's great. You're interested in cardiology. That's awesome. Okay, well, cardiology, the hours are like this. This is what the scope of the field looks like. Uh, this is what we do. Uh, if you're interested in projects, I have XYZ projects going on. You are more than welcome to get on board with me. Um, so, yeah, again, I can talk all day about fellowships, uh, but additional points of how to secure a fellowship, they're quite broad for this topic. And we will discuss them in a subsequent series. Right, Tavi? Um, yes, absolutely correct. As long as oh, you're sorry, I think you're muted. Um, are you able to hear me now? I still can't hear you, Tabby. Nope, still cannot hear you. Let's try it now. I think others can't oh, hear me. I guess everyone else can hear you. Maybe I don't know why I cannot hear you. Okay. Uh, well. Right. I hope I can just type it to you, Dr. Shake, but for the Tommy, can you hear me? I think we're echoing because you have two screens on. Hold on, I think I got it. Sorry. Can okay. You hear me now. Yeah, I can hear you now. All right, wonderful. I was saying, absolutely, we can do another one as long as you're available. That's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I will end with saying that these are my uh, handles. You can follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. If you have any questions, you can always email me as well, too. I'll be more than happy to answer anybody's questions. Um, this right here is the Massachusetts General Hospital um, uh, building, the Bigelow building, the, the main building. Uh, this is what's on all the, uh, the Massachusetts General Hospital handbook. It's a really nice place um, and Boston's a beautiful city. If anyone has time to come check it out, definitely should. So now I'll leave the floor open for questions. Um, and it's okay if I go over, right, Tabby? I can answer some questions, right? Uh, yes, absolutely. I think, uh, Dr. Sheikh, we, do, we should tell everybody <clears throat> that you're actually moving back to Dallas. Um, oh, yes. Hopes of catching you in Boston. Yo, yeah, yeah. So uh, I'll be moving to Dallas soon. So uh, if you're here, then we can uh, definitely hang out. 
All right. So uh, if anybody has any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Um, let's see. So they have, have the have option any... of either putting it in the chat, <clears throat> but it would be uh, better if you just mm -hmm. unmute yourself or raise your hand. Um, sure. Ask any questions that way. So I'll go ahead and start off with some of the questions that we got online. Um, yeah, sure. Thank you so much, first of all, for taking out time for all of us. No worries. Very no worries. Mm -hmm. So we mentioned in the beginning that you received several um, awards and accomplishments for your um, one of the things being your efficiency in the residency program. Yeah, it was. One, so it was. Uh, yeah, it was like. a. So when you get into residency, there are a lot of different types of like accolades and awards you can get. One of them is the Alpha Omega Alpha Award. That's typically what uh, U.S. medical students typically achieve. And that has to do with board scores. Um, for me, I achieved this in my last year of residency. And um, I think it was due to um, the research projects that I had, the, the um, educational activities that I was involved in, in addition to some patient care related stuff. Uh, in addition to the comments that were uh, perceived by some of the patients that I was working with. Um, and then the Arnold P. Gold Humanism Excellence in Teaching Award, this is also provided by some academic institutions. And just, excuse me, it's an award that usually medical students give to um, uh, residents and fellows um, about, you know, just their ability to teach. It's just a teaching award. And this uh, Outstanding Resident Award is, I think, just comprehensively about uh, student feedback and academics and educational stuff that you're involved in research activities in addition to like patient clinical care. So uh, was there a question about that? Yes, well, well first of all, wonderful. And you know, congratulations mm -hmm. to all of us. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned research, that's going to be a requirement for a lot of us. How did you set aside time for that? Any Good question. That? Um, yeah, so you're not really given so it depends on what institution you're at. Some institutions like, you know, Mass General, they do provide some research months and even some uh, programs in residency, they have separate months allocated towards doing research. Now, um, there can be a lot of different types of research that you can do. There can be um, research involved with just case reports, case series. There can be uh, prospective studies where you're uh, looking at specific disease outcomes with time or different processes with time. Uh, there can also be retrospective studies where you're looking through patient charts, looking at a specific disease. There could be even case control studies or looking at you know cross-sectional studies. Um, so a lot of different types of studies you can do. Obviously, they all take time to do. Residency is really tough already, and it's hard to do it. What I would recommend is when you first started getting out, the first couple of weeks, try to um, obviously, first and foremost, is to understand the culture, understand how things are done, understand how to take care of patients, understand the practice of medicine. Everyone has studied the theory of medicine. The practice of medicine is what residency is for and the ins and outs of residency and training. So that's always first and foremost. You will be clinicians at the very top. The scientist aspect will come later on or the research aspect will come later on. So once you get the hang of things and your clinical rotations, your patient care is fine, your notes are more efficient, you're doing well, then depending on what your area of subspecialty is or depending on what your area of interest is in, then reach out to some of the people who are already doing research in that area. Or you can reach out to program leadership and be like, hey, listen, I'm interested in doing some research. Uh, do you have any projects signed up or lined up? So for example, for me, I was interested in uh, a combination of neurocritical care and uh, epilepsy. So I went up to my one of my attendings and I said, hey, listen, I'm interested in uh, neurocritical care and epilepsy, do you have any projects in mind? And he actually said, oh yeah, that's actually a really good topic. That's actually a really good area. I have some projects that you can do for me. I have some projects that you can do. And to and you know, with that, we looked at a specific type of EEG pattern in uh, critically ill patients, and we looked at the outcome in those patients. And it was a retrospective uh, study. And uh, this was recently where I, where I did this um, at MGH. So yeah, you can definitely do things like that. Uh, reach out to uh, leadership, reach out to your mentors, reach out to senior residents or senior fellows who are doing research already and see, hey, listen, I'm interested in an area of specialty. What can I do to get involved? How can I help you out? And they'll be more than happy to help you out and get you on the project. And same thing goes with teaching and education. Um, for me, I have a very strong interest in education. So I always look for opportunities to educate and teach. Wonderful. Thank you so much. 
Um, I believe there is a question from us. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Sheikh, uh, would you tell me how you were able to achieve neurology residency setting aside from scores? What neurology PDs uh, want to see incoming residents? Yeah, good, good question. Um, I think that may be a little bit outside the scope of this chapter or this lecture, but get my email down and we'll chat. Does that, does that sound okay, uh, Azar? Um, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, man. Yeah, great, great. So get, get my email down, uh, send me an email, and then we'll set aside a time and we'll chat, okay? Um, are you, uh, Azar, are you, if you don't mind me asking, uh, are you uh, going to be in residency soon or are you looking to apply? I'm looking to apply. Okay, great. Yeah, so uh, give my email down, shoot me a message, and we'll chat. Yeah, Dr. Sheikh, can I talk about our Discord channel and... Uh... Oh, yeah, go for it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So I yeah. wanted to just put the word out there yeah. that uh, Dr. Sheikh is, in fact, on our Discord channel. Um, we try our best to be very respectful of his time. But for those of us applying into neurology or just applying in general, if you comment in the general match applicants channel, then Dr. Sheikh is able to see those messages and reply to them. So you can also get a hold of him there as well. Yeah, perfect. That's another way too. I actually forgot about that, but yes, that's another way. Great. Um, any other questions, Tabby? Did we get any other questions from online? Um, we, well, First, most of the questions that we got, uh, I was keeping track and you answered them throughout the presentation. Oh, okay, great. So if we will give a moment or so, if we don't have any other online <clears> questions, <throat> then this will be a wrap for the session. Um, while we're waiting on that, I did want to ask you, Dr. Sheikh, yeah, how sure. was it for you um, to decide, okay, I'm going to go into residency. Um, how did you go from going to a medical school in a different country? and then mm -hmm. coming back to the U.S. where you grew up um, mm -hmm. and to start residency. Were there any things that you picked up on the way, things you want to share with everybody today? Yeah, yeah, good good point. So um, I will, So during medical school, I actually got a partial scholarship to go uh, to MGH here to do some rotations as an as a exchange student. Um, it was a partial scholarship. It was funded by my university. Um, and I did a month in neurosurgery, a month in neuroradiology, and a month in neuropathology. Uh, I actually learned a lot in those three months, to be honest with you. It was it was quite a bit of learning curve. It was a big uh, culture shock, <laughs> despite me being grown up in the United States. Uh, it was a big culture shock about how they do things, about how the practices, about how residents are, how to communicate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I learned from that. And I tried to implement some of those same cultures into our medical school back again amongst our amongst the the, the training there. And um, not only that, but after I graduated, I did a couple of postgraduate clinical sub-internships. I did one at George Washington University, uh, and I did another one at uh, Larkin Community Hospital slash University of Miami. So um, those are two rotations that I did. And from those two rotations, I really learned uh, the, collegial the collegiality between uh, co resident co uh, interns or co externs for the most part. So you learn a lot of I learned a lot from my co-externs during my time as postgraduate clinical sub-internship. I learned a lot from my rotations here as a student. Um, and then I learned a lot during residency as well. You know, uh, during residency, I had a couple of close buddies and my residency program, there were a lot of other international medical graduates. So we were all kind of learning together. Um, and then there were some uh, AMGs who were also, you know, in, you know, coming from their different backgrounds from different states and matching into Toledo, Ohio. And we kind of all like came together as one group. One thing that I really found helpful was um, we every Friday night, it was uh, the internal medicine residents, the anesthesiology residents, the PMR residents, and the neurology residents. We would all just hang out and chill. And um, we'd go out, we would go to like dinner, we'd go to bars, we'd watch the game together. Um, so this was a good way to understand the culture, understand the environment, understand um, how uh, your co-residents fells are. And actually what it does, it actually not only develops collegiality, but it also helps you with that well-being and that understanding of, you know what, you're not alone. It helps with the imposter syndrome. And, and it makes, you know, your overall workflow a lot easier. So it got to a point where I wasn't calling for consoles. I was calling my buddies. I was calling my homies. Hey, listen, bro, I got a console. Do you want to come see him? And then we kind of just, you know, chop it up about the console for a little while. So this is how, you know, uh, I would say the culture is. It's a learning process. 
Um, you have to be a little bit flexible and your some of your ideologies, but not completely disarray. But understand that, hey, listen, sometimes other cultures do this different this way. And uh, even though I don't do it, it may be OK for me to just be around it, you know. So that's just what I would like to say in a nutshell. But, you know, have your limits. Everyone is a little bit different. Everyone does things a little bit differently. So it's up to you. Um, but I think it, it is a learning curve. You just have to adapt for the most part, if that helped a little bit. The days in, the day in, day out workflow, that will be picked up with ease. You will learn how to do things. You will learn how to call consults. You will learn how to uh, write notes efficiently. That will happen. That's just the process of residency. Your communication and whatnot, that will also happen with, with time because you will learn from your senior residents. You will learn from your mentors and mentees. Um, and th that's a process. You'll learn it. Well, we're all certainly looking forward to <clears throat> telling in it, I suppose. Um, we do have a question from uh, Paolo. If you could go ahead, please. Yeah, sure. There's uh, So I see a question about from Paolo. I also have a question about Ifan Jawad. Um, so I'll answer Efan Jawad because his question is first, then I'll go to Palab if that's okay. So Efan has a question saying, I have a question, please. I have progress scores in step one, step two, respectively. My question is, it matter to score higher than step two score, which is in this case 250 plus. I'm afraid to get lower than that and affect my match in upcoming season one. Good question. Uh, so I think this may be a good question for that Discord um, uh, conversation to have. Uh, but in a nutshell, um, I'm all, I'm pretty open with my scores. I tell all my students at Kaplan as well, too. My step one back when, it when they were actually scoring and it wasn't a pass or fail, it was a 238. My step two was a 255. I got a 231 on my step three. I got a pass step two CS. At that time, they had step two CS. Um, and I passed that on my first attempt, too. Um, I think what is a good score briefly is that you do uh, at least Either, either at the mean, at the average, at the national average, or slightly above, 10 points above national average. And you can use NBME scores to help you with that. We can chat a little bit more offline on, um, we can chat a little bit more offline and on uh, Discord about it a little bit more. Uh, Paula, I'll answer his question. I think he may have logged off, but I'll answer it anyway. So if he wants to review the, the video, he can. One for presentation, I have a question regarding your interventional fellowship. Um, oh, is he still on? Paul, are you still on? Yeah, I'm still on. I'm still on. Yeah. I got disconnected. Uh, sure, no worries. Paul, what's your question? Uh, yes, uh, wonderful presentation, by the way, Dr. Sheikh. Thank you. Uh, I, I wanted to ask whether, I mean, uh, I'm you know, I'm actually a recent day applicant for this upcoming cycle. I wanted mm -hmm. to ask more about, uh, because I'm more interested in stroke and yeah. interventional care, mainly. Awesome. Interventional. Awesome. So I wanted to know, like, um, there's a vascular uh, neurology. There is also a separate, I think Michigan, you know, say Michigan has a purely neurointerventional fellowship. Uh, yes. So I wanted to uh, divide, like, uh, what is the difference? Is it like, is the same thing or is there some sort of... Uh, no. it's kind so of it's, yeah, it's, it's a good question. And this uh, this question, I think we can also talk about uh, on Discord a little bit. Um, I will say, though, in a nutshell, uh, there is a separate neurointerventional fellowship that is through the neurosurgery residency program that is neurosurgery operated. Then there is a vascular neurology slash vascular interventional fellowship, which is primarily a neurology program. So what I would what I would recommend you doing is take a look at these two examples. So for example, the neurointerventional fellowship that's directly underneath the neurosurgery, a prime example of that is the program at Massachusetts General Hospital, okay? Then you look at the, uh, then that's one thing I want you to do. The next thing, I also want you to look at the University of Toledo Medical Center, where I train after residency. They have both the Vascular Neurology Fellowship and they have a Neurointerventional Fellowship that is directly under the leadership of clinically trained neurologists, not neurosurgeons. Right. So those are the two things. At least that will lead you into the right direction in terms of what the expectation outcome is. But it is possible to go into a Vascular Neurology Stroke Fellowship and then go into a Neurointerventional Fellowship after that um, as a neurologist. You can do it. So, and there are a lot of programs out there. University of Toledo is a good program of that. Very good stroke slash neurointerventional program, um, as well as Thomas Jefferson University. Very good stroke and fellowship program. And uh, again, we can chat more about that on Discord. And um, when the time comes, if you're interested, I can get you in touch with the right people. Thank you very much. So guys, any... we want to give Dr. Sheikh a grace period of five minutes. So if you have any questions, please come out with them now or that, or we can let him go and enjoy his evening. No worries, no worries. Plans for his Friday evening. No worries. Yeah, we'll give it 
uh, up until 820. And if there's no questions, then uh, we'll, we'll call it. Is that okay? Of course, absolutely. And then I'm, again, I'm, I'm available by these social media handles. You can also reach me by email and I'll be more than happy to answer whatever questions that you know may come your way. So we have a question about exercise and working out. Um, it Yeah, is how yeah. essential and how to fit it into your schedule. Extremely essential, extremely essential. Um, so I'll, I'll be honest with you. I do work out daily. I, I have a gym. I'm at an apartment complex here. In my apartment complex, I have an indoor basketball court. I actually just came back from playing ball before we talked. So uh, I work out almost every day. Um, I think it's very important. Even if you do 30 minutes of exercise a day, whatever it is, Uh, I think it's very good for well-being. I think not only does it help with, you know, the medical, it, like medically, like you're preventing cardiovascular disease and, you know, um, increasing blood flow and circulation in your body, preventing DVTs and stuff like that. But what it also does, it also clears the mind. It also does a lot for the mind. It helps you to um, uh, take away stress, especially if you're lifting weights, um, helps to ease stress, helps to sleep at night too. If you're, especially if you're dealing with a lot of anxiety from work day and you're not really sleeping well at night, working out is a good way to help you relieve stress and help you to sleep at night. Remember, when you exercise, you actually release endorphins, which is the feel good hormone. It's the same type of uh, uh, feel good response that you would get from taking, you know, uh, over the counter drug or sorry, not over the counter, but, you know, like drugs like opioids or marijuana. But instead of doing those toxic things, I would recommend, um, you know, exercising, which can release endorphins and actually make you feel good and keep you healthy. So I think it's very important. If at, if you're not able to do it daily, which I understand depending on rotation, it's really hard to do. But if you're simply, you know, maybe doing 15 to 20 minutes every other day, I think it's also reasonable too. find a hobby that you like. I love playing ball. So I usually just play basketball. Okay, great. All right. And we have three minutes. So Strong vote for working out from Dr. Shane. Yeah, I, I, I do recommend it. Absolutely. Um, and eating healthy, too. Uh, it's easy to get bogged down in eating junk food and hospital food and whatnot. Surprisingly, hospital food is not always the, it's not always the best. Um, so make sure you have a well-balanced diet. Uh, let's see. I think we got another message. Thanks so much for information. How would you suggest getting involved in research activities of your program? Is it a uh, good question? Yes. So that is a very strong question. And um, I'll answer that. There are some community-based programs that are not very heavy in academics uh, and not very heavy in research. I understand that. Going into community-based programs, you don't really see that. But there's always things you can do in research. There's always things you can do. So you can do quality improvement-based projects. You can look at, um, uh, at community-based statistics. For example, just hypothetically speaking, if you want to know the incidence of TB in your county for patients with, with HIV and know, acknowledge that there is a problem. And then from there, figuring out ways of how patients are not, you know, getting treatment for that. That's something you can do. That's just a hypothetical example. Actually, probably not the best one, but um, oftentimes, like I said, reach out to your mentors and mentees. Um, another way you can do this, and this is something that I recommend to some of my interns, is that you will, as interns, depending on what's a specialty you're in, whether it's neurology, whether it's internal medicine, there are societies out there. There's the um, American Medical Society. There is the uh, American Academy of Medical Colleges. There is the American Medical Association for Neurology. There's the American Neurology Association, the American Academy of Neurology, the um, so many different you know societies. And a lot of them have separate sections for residents and fellows. And you can easily find a mentor mentee from those societies. You can easily reach out to a member in that society and say, hey, listen, I'm so-and-so from XYZ University. Uh, they don't, I'm very interested in this specific area of medicine. We don't really have that here. What can I do with the society to help get my foot in the door? And you can be more than happy to work with some of those people. To be honest with you, um, the, for example, the American Academy of Neurology has a separate residence and fellow section that a lot of people can be a part of and get their foot in the door with the American Academy of Neurology and get their foot in the door with research opportunities and other academic opportunities. So hopefully that 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 helps. If if so, first and foremost, uh, ask your program leadership and mentors and mentees if there's any research projects. If not, then uh, the, there's always some there's always some society that helps out. All right, so HN asked a question. It says, how to manage making food during busy residency? Absolutely, meal prep, meal prep. The days that you're off, prep for the week. 
Um, there's a lot of different recipes online that we can, I can share with you. A lot of people uh, that I don't know personally, but are on Instagram that make, that do meal prep with foods. Um, you can easily look at them. So what I did when I was a resident, I meal prep for on, like I was off usually one day, either on Saturday or one day on Sunday. And I prepped for the whole week. I went out, got groceries, came back and I made food for the whole week. I put it in the freezer, made it in separate bowls, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And I prepped that way. I prepped that way. It was kind of mundane, I understand, but it was one way to help me get proper food and nutrition that was high protein, low carb diet, especially on those busy rotations. Okay. Um, no, no, it's actually a very good question. No, no, it's not. It's not. Not at all. Um, okay, guys. I think that's all the time we have for today. Again, I'm available by Discord. You can always email me too. Follow me on social media. I'll be more than happy to answer whatever questions that you may have. Thank you again, Tabby. Thank, uh, thanks everyone for paying attention and listening. Um, bye. Well, thank you, Dr. Sheikh, for giving us your time. Uh, we no really worries. appreciate it. And hope you get to enjoy some of your Friday evening. No worries. No worries. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. We'll thanks. see you next thanks. time. Thanks. Bye. bye.